Hi everybody, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been two fabulous days and I think this is the second last talk. Uh, and, and we, I think almost every talk had uh, a lot of math, this being the math department and the Fourier talks and so on. Uh, this talk is distinguished by not having a single equation in there. Okay. So there's nothing, no math and so on. So I hope everybody will have fun. It'll have a lot of images and so on. Um, <clears throat> So let, let me let me give you a some sort of a preface, right? So this talk is really about from the machine learning point of view. My my area is computer vision, right? So we want to learn about the visual world. We want to create machines that can learn about the visual world, right? And there's a lot lot of math over there, right? This this work is more applied. This is about ideas and so on. We'll get into that. The, I'm not talk, going to talk about any machine learning theory over here. Uh, we were talking about some ways to formalize some of the things that we are doing over here, but this is rather applied, right? And this is also sort of an invitation to say that there are lots of very, very cool, interesting problems that are there in the applied, uh, you know, in the applications area. And we guys to collab should collaborate, uh, you know, much more together. Uh, you'll get some interesting problems to work on, and we'll get some mathematical heft, right? And do things more formally. Okay, so let me get into this. This is a. <coughs> um, okay, there you go. All right. So this is a joint work. So I do a lot of collaborations. So this is a joint work with the University of California at Merced, uh, Professor Ming, Ming Shuan Yang, and uh, Professor Jia Bin Huang at Virginia Tech. And then obviously we all are just you know blabbering. And the person who worked on this is the student who is uh, the first author here. And you actually can find uh, the paper as well as the code and the pre-trained models and so on on GitHub. I would welcome you all to you know sort of play with them, and, and you can contact us if you have any questions and so on, right? Okay, so we all know by now five years into neural networks that that neural networks are magical. You know, some it, they actually are magical because black magic happens over there. Nobody knows why things happen, but you get fabulous uh, results, right? So let me show you something. So you start with that, which is like a blob. And you can train a mathematical function to go from that low resolution image, which is just a blob, right? And, and, and you can get a really high resolution image like this. You can train a network to do that. It's, it's, it's nothing, it's, you're training a complex mathematical function, you're doing a lot of, uh, I would say, hallucination or interpolation based on the data domain. You, you, you're saying that this thing, this, in, this obviously is a, 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 a uh, an ill post problem, so you have a lot of priors. Those priors come from the, from the domain, the pattern that you are trying to reconstruct, right? So you have a lot of data which represents that prior. So it's really data driven. You don't have mathematical priors over here, and you magically learn this uh, function, right? You can take other examples. You can do semantic segmentation now. Very uh, nice semantic segmentation. You can get out objects, their boundaries, and so on. You can say each at the level of each pixel where they are coming from, right? You can do. You can find out all kinds of things in images, where they are, what the confidence is, irrespective of the pose, the severe occlusions that might be there, and so on and so forth, right? You can. You you must have seen all of these kind of examples all of the over the place. Uh, now, you can do really, really fancy things. You can, you can turn a horse into a zebra, <laughs> right? So, so they clearly are, there's something, you know, and there's something wrong over here, right? I, I, I would be the first one to admit, right? Uh, but you actually can do this. There's no cheating going on. You actually can train. You actually can imagine in some, in some way things that, you know, are rather difficult for you to do uh, without having large amounts of data and, and these complicated machines and, and learning algorithms which can train these machines, right? So how does this happen, right? So mostly, I would not say all of these things, but to some extent or the other, it is mostly supervised machine learning, right? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that, and I don't know whether it's on the other side, okay, I'll get into this, but what I mean by that is that, you know, you have large amounts of data, right? You have uh, uh, labels on that data. So you have pairs of examples for, you know, the input, the, the domain and range of the function, and you have huge numbers of them, right? And you have, uh, you know, models which can virtually represent any uh, function, right? And you have learning algorithms which can train those models, right? And now exactly how these things are happening, there are also some tricks of the trade, and you do a lot of, you know, get a few smart students to work on these, apply a 
a few nice rules of thumb, and you can train net and get GPUs, right? Do some hyper hyperparameter optimization. The more the number of GPUs, the better it is, and so on, right? And you can get this done, all right? Uh, but the problem is that I thought, okay, all right. Yeah, the problem is that that you know you need lots and lots of data, right? So a lot of the successes that we saw in the past few years were on the base, you know, they, they were kind of, they, they rode over uh, something which, uh, the backbone which was provide, provided by uh, ImageNet, right? So ImageNet is a large image data set, about uh, 14 million images and counting now, right? Um, but it's a labeled data set, right? So, so there was a lot of effort that went into labeling these images, right? So you can imagine, you know, if you want to generate labels, and if, you, if say, a label costs you 10 cents or even a cent, right, and it costs you one second per image, then the number of the amount of time and effort that went into labeling this data, right? So there are, are about 40,000 uh, categories over there, right? Uh, you can do some math to find out that if you had a single person label this, then it would take 19 years, right? And there was a crowdsourcing, so a lot of parallelization. You got about 1,000 people working on this all over the world, and you could get it done in a few months' time, right? But as a business, it's, it's really non-scalable for us, right? So this is an, an image classification problem. So you take an image, you can classify it, right? But there are tons and tons of problems to be solved. So, so that, that forms the premise of this work, that we really cannot think of doing machine learning entirely in the supervised way, OK? So. <clears throat> So, so, so this was labels per image, right? But what if you want labels per pixel? You have a million pixels per image, so you multiply that task by a million times, right? Uh, what about, about if you want to go for a video? Now you suddenly have a huge amount of data, right? And this just doesn't work this way, right? OK, and then you have, you have to multiply that by the number of areas, applications, and so on and so forth. This particular list was taken from not a mainstream vision conference. It's, workshop on assistive computer vision and robotics, right? And, and, and you can see a list of tasks over there. And if you go into computer vision, computer vision is basically about visual understanding of the world. Anything that we can do with the eyes, we want computers to be able to do. There are a huge number of tasks. So we cannot get labels, label data for all those tasks. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the challenge, right? So, so this, this whole paradigm is not really scalable. OK. So obviously, we have examples uh, of other kind of autonomous agents, which is us humans, uh, who can, uh, you know, who learn and understand the, the visual world, right? And they, and we do it in a very different fashion, right? Uh, if I, I have two small kids, when I train them, I'm not telling them what, what the semantics of each pixel is, right? I'm mostly just talking with them, you know, at a very high level, pointing things to them, right? Not even saying that, okay, this is my hand, this is my finger, and so on and so forth. They're largely doing uh, learning in a very self-supervised fashion, right? So, so, so we obviously take, you know, our, uh, <coughs> uh, how do I call it, motivation, right, uh, uh, from, from, from how human, humans learn, right? And there are lots of things that you can do, right? You can, and, 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 and the claim that I make over here is that we have to go that, we have to take, take that route for various kinds of different reasons, right? Not just because we want to solve practical problems, but what does it even mean to solve problems? What does it mean to, re, uh, to reason at different levels of abstractions and so on, right? And, they, and, and abstractions come about if, if you pose problems to be solved at a particular level. If you're just going to learn mathematical functions, then you're just going to learn mathematical functions. Right? So it also depends upon what kind of tasks you give the machine to learn. Right? So, so there are lots of things that we, we, you, you would probably see uh, happening in the next few years, right? taking this kind of motivation from how, how humans learn, and they are already happening in our, in our area, uh, whereby you, you, you build generic reasoning machines which can you know, uh, use leverage knowledge from the world in different ways. They can create knowledge. Right? And they can learn in a largely self-supervised and weakly supervised fashion. Supervision is needed, but it is not needed at the level that we are seeing right now. Okay? So let me skip. Okay, all right, I'll skip all of that. All right, so, so, so this particular uh, work that we did, and this was presented at ICCV uh, in October, 
is basically about, about this, this thing, uh, saying that you know, we have lots and lots of unlabeled data which is available, which is just lying out there. We have data from, you, know, you can go to Google Images, you can download images from there, you can go to YouTube, you can download videos from there, you can go to Flickr, you can get data from there. Some of these you can get for free, some others you can pay. Right? But the problem is that of labeling them. Right? And you can, you can get a lot of video data in a couple of days' time. It doesn't take too much time to get data. Right? But the question is, if you don't have labels on that data, how do you learn from them? Right? So, <clears throat> so this, is the, you know, this is what the talk is about. Right? So let me give you a, so OK, from the business point of view, it's very important for us, as I, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's, it's even more costly for us to sort of, I mean, I'll, I'll come, I talked about the cost, but let me talk about another thing, right? which is that you know, when we create new applications in the market, Right? Uh, so we are the data analytics company. We are the B2B, business to business data anal analytics company. Right? We, we go to the client and we say, we have people who can solve your problem. So they ask you, you know, do you already have something? So we, we, don't, we can solve it. We know we can solve it. We don't have the data yet. We really cannot. We don't have a trained model right now to give, give to you. Can, you. can you just give us some data? And that's where the conversation stops. Right? So, so, so you don't have the data. We don't own data. We don't create data. We work on other people's data, right? But if you don't have data, then how do you build uh, the solution to that, right? So it's kind of a chicken. And if we cannot build solutions, we don't have a priori solutions, then we cannot get data to, to, to sort of uh, you know, get better, right? So that's the kind of chicken and egg problem that we find ourselves in. There are different uh, ways to solve that particular problem, right? Uh, but one of the things is that you know, okay, you can get data, perhaps not sim not same data, similar data somewhere, right? And you don't have annotations now, right? How do you learn from that? Again, I'm I'm just talking about the same thing. Okay, so we are in this uh, regime of you can simulate data. We are doing a lot of simulations also. You can use common sense uh, knowledge. You can go to Wikipedia if you're doing visual. Say you want to recognize a bird of a particular category. You can go to the wiki page, identify what you know, what is the description of a bird. Use that description to learn visual classifiers. We are also working on that problem. This particular talk is about you know learning from uh, unlabeled data, right? Okay, so that's the unsupervised uh, machine learning regime, right? So one common way that I think almost everybody is familiar about is reconstruction, right? So what you can do is so this is like PCA kind of a thing, right? So what you can do is you you, you have the original image, right? Uh, you go to the some some uh, latent space, right, to represent that, right? It's an information bottleneck. You you want a very succinct representation for that, right? Uh, so you, 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 you want to represent it with as few bits uh, as possible, but then you don't want to lose information, right? So you, have, you want to reconstruct it back, right? And you want that uh, error to be uh, small, right? So this is one regime, right? And you can say, okay, these are good representations that come out of there. So that's uh, disputable, but you can say that these are good representations. So that's one way that you can use. And for this, I don't use any label, labels, right? It's just completely unlabeled data. So you can say, okay, well, I can build representations like these, and I can take these representations, and I can show that they work really well on, you know, you can, you know, you know on classification tasks. So all you need is now you've learned the representation, you've learned the space in which the data lies. All you need to do is build a classifier in that space, right? So that's an easier problem, right? Uh, so that's one uh, approach. Uh, now, off late, uh, some other, you know, um, ideas. Uh, are, are becoming very popular in this field, and, and they're called self-supervised learning. So, uh, so the thing is that beyond reconstruction, can you create other supervisory signals from the data them itself, right, which will help you learn? Uh, <clears throat> and and, and that, that supervision creates a surrogate task. So you define that particular task, right, and you train the machine to solve that task. But then the representations that come about, you show that those are, the hope is that those representations are really good for good visual representations for all the things around us. Right? OK, so what kind of things can you do? So this first example right, is that you, know, you can take a color image, right? And you can try to you know, just take the, you know, what is it called, the uh, luminance channel, right? And then from there, predict the chromaticity of the image, right? So you can, you, can, you can try to train a machine for which the input is this image and the output is this image. Now, for this, you don't really need any labeled data, right? You, can, you just need color images, right? 
you can you can become a little bit more fancy you can say that okay i can take an input image i can take the gray scale out i can take the color channels out i can take the gray scale to predict the color i can take the color to predict the uh, the gray scale and i can put it all back together right so again you don't need any label data for this right and and the hope is that if you are able to train a machine to be able to solve this task then it actually learns features which are useful for solving other visual tasks right <clears throat> you can also do some really fancy stuff you can take a video which has images and which has audio in it and then you can say okay i can do some you know audio is predictive of what is content in the image right so this is out of mit bill freeman's uh, lab um, and and you say okay so what i do is i take these audio signals i can cluster them right and i can get those cluster labels right and i can try to see if you can predict you know which cluster the image lies in from the visual component only right and then they show that you know you can learn really nice representations from this right similarly you can now uh, go to uh, we are talking about modality you, you can go from uh, you know the the you know appearance space to motion space right so as an example you can say that okay uh, i have a few frames right let me take a couple of frames and let me find let me use those frames to predict uh, what the motion vectors are going to be for say some subsequent k frames right all what you can do is you can take the first frame and the last frame and you, you take optical flow right in between and you say that if i have, have a representation over here a another representation over here a prime and this represents a geometric transformation between them then can i say that you know when t is applied to a you get a prime right now what you can do is you can you can take data which actually you know and then you say you know a applied to or t applied to a gives me a prime is this correct or wrong right so you can take paired data like this and then uh, for you know negative examples you can take something else over here or you can take optical flow from some other place and and the task for the machine is to be able to say whether you know these are consistent with each other or not right so this is now an interplay between appearance and motion right you can you can try to solve visual puzzles right what you can do is okay you can take out, cut out the part of the image from from the middle and you can try to predict what it is right similarly what you can do is you can you can break an image into you know we have all solved these visual jigsaw puzzles right and you you train the machine to solve the jigsaw puzzle right okay some some interesting work came out recently which was basically just counting based right so you say that every object right so let's say this object is a whole one right if i was to divide the image into two parts then half of this object goes over there and half of the object goes over here right so you should have additivity right so they just use this additivity idea to see whether we can actually learn nice representations which which then give you this additivity in the output space <clears throat> then you can go to temporal context and so on let's skip this right i think uh, we are already 15 minutes into this okay all right so this is about so so this I, the, the, what i'm talking about over here is you know that there is some semantics so there is some understanding which lies in the correct ordering of 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 video frames so if you take some video frames out then you kind of get stuck with this kind of situation where you know things are just not right so if you, if you just move the so so this is the this is the idea uh, that this particular work is built upon that you take a video right take a few frames right you know ex that the you know let's say four frames right and you know the first frame precedes the second frame which precedes the third frame and so on they are in in order now you jumble them up right and then you ask the machine to predict the right order right so that's what this work is about all right so we take the original video and we can we, we they don't have to be uh, you know exactly contiguous right if they are then it's, it's very very highly correlated correlated and so on you probably don't learn that much right so you can take you know you can drop a few frames in between if you can take them apart right and then what you do is so so this is the order that we know right frame number 30th comes before 36th before 39th and so on right and you can jumble them up right so now you have a shuffled sequence this goes into the machine this this forms the input to the machine and the output should be it should be able to say that this is bcad that that's the order 
right? Okay. All right. So this is this is the this is what we did for uh, this thing, right? So so what we do is we take a simple convolutional architecture, right? And we replicate it four times. Okay. And all of these weights are tied. It's exactly the same architecture. It's just replicated, right? So you get exactly the same function applied to all the four uh, frames, and you get some representation, right? So let's forget about the pairwise comparison part in the middle. What you can do is now you can take these representations and, and then you can build a classifier on top of that, right? Basically, which maps into one of these uh, uh, four factorial classes, right? And says which class is it, which order is it? And we know the right class because we constructed the data like this, right? Turns out that you cannot really, you don't gain much by doing that. You cannot really learn very well by doing that, right? And uh, and we actually found it empirically. There's no theory behind it or whatever, right? Uh, so what we found out was that it's very hard to take all of these, you know, uh, representations which are uh, a few frames apart and try and ask the, and train the machine to figure out the right order of these. So what we did was we said, okay, let's take pairs, and all we want to do is to get representations first or features first, which are predictive of the order of pairs. So that's what this middle part of the network is. So you can take all of the pairs, right, four C2 pairs, and you can, you can then you have, you want to learn a representation which is useful for, for predicting, you know, whether the blue feature comes before the red feature and so on. Okay, and once we had this pairwise comparison network, then we were able to train this network well. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll skip this training tricks part. So then, and then we basically, there are some things that you, we did. Uh, you know, I can talk to you offline about this. OK, so, so what we did was that we learned representations like this, right? OK, so now we have representations for every frame, right? And then we applied it on an action recognition uh, data set. So this is uh, from UCF, and there are 101 categories. There are about 13,000 clips, uh, you know, a fair amount of data over there. Uh, <clears throat> And, and, and here is what, so okay. So, so what we did was that, you know, you, you take a standard uh, action classification network, right? And you kind of feed in your uh, trained features, pre-learned features into that network and start from there instead of starting from scra scratch, right? And that's the comparison that I show you over here, right? So if you take a network, right, and you randomly initialize it, with weights, and that's what's traditionally done. And then you try to learn uh, or train the action classifier, then you only get about 47.8%, right? Okay, um, and, and obviously this differs from architecture to architecture. So if you take LXNet, you get something. If you, get, if you take another architecture, then you might get a different uh, accuracy and so on, right? But what we showed was that, you know, from that random initialization, if you use the pre-trained weights from our network, then you get a lift of about 7%, which is fairly significant, right? Uh, you can try other ideas. Not, not to be fair, you know, you, uh, so we also compared it with ImageNet, right? So these are ImageNet features. But these are features which are learned on 14 million images with lots of labels, right? So we would like to inch up to that, but we are not up to that right now, right? Using this purely self-supervised learning technique. There are, there are other, uh, you know, uh, self-supervised learning techniques that we compared against, uh, but we got fairly, and I can talk about them later. I talked about some of them in the, in the motivation slides, right? You can, this, these are similar, but not exactly the same, and we can talk about them later, okay? And then we took another data set. This is out of MIT, HMDB uh, 51 data set. There are 51 human activities that they daily do, perhaps, right? About 7,000 clips. Uh, at least one second duration, and then we got kind of similar results over there. Not not as great as on the previous one, but we got similar results. And then we also applied it to a, a purely image classification and det detection task, right? So this is purely on images, right? And for that, we we took this Pascal VOC uh, 2007 data set, which had about 21,000 images and 20 classes. And we got similar kind of uh, results. Here, though, you know, these were not as great. And the reason for this is that you know, we trained on videos. And the resolution on, of videos is, is quite low. right? The quality is quite low. And then you are trying to solve a task on images. 
where the resolution is quite high. So if you have, if you start with, with uh, uh, you know, features or networks which have been pre-trained on images, then you'll get a much higher, much better result. So we did not get that great result, but we did get, uh, you know, at least uh, with respect to all the self-supervised uh, learning techniques, we got better results. Now, now something which is not here, and the other thing I would like to point out is that we actually um, used small amounts of data to, and, and we were able to train in a faster you know, training regime or we, in, 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 a, in a smaller amount of time to get better results. Okay, so, th so that uh, those are also, uh, you know, we can also talk about that later if, you, if you're interested. Um, one thing that I, li I like to point out, right? So, so there are so many, and this is kind of nearing the, okay, I'll, I'll talk about this and then I'll make that comment. So is something useful being learned, right? So here I'm showing two visualizations, right? And this is just purely to solve the shuffling task, right? So what kind of weights do you learn? So you can see all of these, you know, at the, at the, at the first layer, you, you start, you see all of, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, edge-like features, oriented steerable filters kind of features and so on that are being learned over here, right? Which, which just, which tells us that, you know, something useful is happening. You, you're kind of learning the right kind of features, right? So if you look at ImageNet and, and, and something, uh, a network which is trained on ImageNet, you roughly see similar features at the first level, right? So, and we also looked at activations at the almost the second last output layer, right? To to sh to see that you know a particular neuron being activated over there, does it represent anything meaningful, right? In in the data, right? Is 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 it is it just some arbitrary statistics that the network is learning to solve the shuffling problem? And you you see that these things are meaningful in the data, right? So it, it's it's learning automatically things that are meaningful for it to be, you know, to solve the supervision task. And that's why we think that it's able to do well on other kind of tasks, uh, visual classification tasks that it doesn't know about. Okay, so the aside that I wanted to, uh, okay, let me summarize. So, uh, so we, 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 we are working in the self-supervised learning regime, right? And we used sequence sorting as a surrogate task, right? We built a network to be able to do that, right? And then we showed that this, whatever you learn on this network, you can transfer that to other tasks, right? Uh, with perhaps small amounts of data. And you need smaller amounts of training, right? Now, one question automatically arises out of this is that, you know, okay, so there are all of these, these uh, you know, other techniques that we, that we saw, right? Why, why not do all of that together? So I've been talking to people, and it seems to be that, you know, if you do a couple of tasks, Together, you get a lift. If you go maybe three, you get an incremental benefit, but beyond three doesn't seem to help. So it seems like right now we are kind of hitting a limit as to what can be done in a self-supervised fashion with, with the kind of tasks that I uh, listed out, uh, with the kind of approaches that I listed. OK? All right, so uh, almost at time, right? So what I would do is I'll, I'll skip all of this. I had something about, you know, I want to talk about who we are and so on, but let me just go to the last slide. And I would just like to say that, you know, we are working on a lot of interesting problems and we are looking for smart people like you to collaborate with, students to come for internships. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, open positions for, you know, uh, uh, full-time staff, right? To work on all kinds of machine learning uh, problems. Uh, at all levels, and when I say all levels, uh, it means the position as well as you know, uh, upstream, downstream, as well as the level of abstraction or the mathematics involved, uh, the disciplines, you know, optimization, right, uh, fundamental uh, machine learning uh, theory problems, and so on and so forth. And uh, over here, I'm I'm collaborating with Radu. We are work we are looking at a couple of problems at least, right? So you, are, you, know, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to him to get a better understanding of, of, of the kind of things that we, that we are working on. Thank you. Thank you.